Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our 2021 uh, USA Field Hockey National Rules Briefing. Uh, my name is Steve Horgan, uh, the Director of Umpiring with USA Field Hockey and uh, the Rules Editor for the NCAA, and we also consult with the NFHS, uh, the high school group. So um, uh, we have a pretty good idea of the rules and uh, what we want to try to get out for this year. This is our annual briefing. It is not a rules seminar. It is not a uh, clinic, so to speak. Um, this is just information, points of emphasis, things of that nature that we want to get across to the hockey world as your uh, hockey season start uh, scholastically. So uh, we'll get into the presentation in just a couple moments. First, I want to introduce you to Casey Niederer. She is our producer behind the scenes. Uh, she'll be flipping back between my presentation and um, uh, me. And uh, she has some things, some direction for you uh, to help you through the presentation uh, to be able to ask questions and a few other things. So I will turn it over to Casey. Awesome. Thank you, Steve. Hello, everyone. Um, many of you have probably seen my face um, on these lovely Monday and Tuesday nights. It's always a good time when I get to spend the night with Steve. So super excited to be here. Um, just some housekeeping things. The top right corner of your screen, you'll see a little circle with like a question mark in it. That is where you're going to go to put any questions, comments, concerns that you have. If there's any technical issues, if you can't hear us, if for some reason the screen goes black, please send a message in there. I will try to address it as soon as possible. In terms of questions, we are going to try to save the majority of the questions until the end of the presentation. But if you do have a question about a specific slide that Steve is currently reading off of, please send it through. I'll try to get it answered while he's talking or before he moves on to the next slide. If I don't answer it, don't worry. I will cover it at the end as well. Um, but besides that, I'm going to send it back to Steve. OK, thanks, Casey. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, We've we've taken the time this year to do this virtually. Uh, typically, we've run a done a recording uh, and then got that out there. But we thought this would be a little bit better, so people would be able to ask questions live and hopefully um, get the answers that you need. Uh, I expect this to be about 45 minutes to an hour. Uh, hopefully, we'll be able to answer everyone's questions and uh, we will go from there. So, uh, without further ado, uh, oh, the last thing is this is being recorded. Uh, it will be on the USA Field Hockey website. Um, I'm going to say sometime tomorrow, and then we will also get it to Arbiter uh, for those umpires there and uh, to the NFHCA. Um, I've been in contact with Kirsten, and we will make sure that everybody gets the recording who wants the recording or at least has access to it, uh, and, and we'll go from there. Uh, Casey, can you show my screen, and we'll start with the presentation. Yep, they should be seeing it now. OK, very good. Thank you. Um, so tonight, here's a, a few things that I'm hoping to get through. Uh, masks, which became an issue after a lot of people watch the Olympics. We'll get to that in a minute. We've already had some issues this year with players returning from suspension. So I want to make sure we deal with that. Uh, we've all also dealt with a couple in even in the first week, some sideline demeanor. So I want to just reiterate a couple things there. And then we got into some questions that have come here recently. Um, Tackling between the legs, shadowing on the self-start, uh, over the end line, intentionally, mainly by the defense. And then, of course, everybody's favorite subject, aerials. So uh, we will do the best we can to get through all of these, and, uh, and we will go from there. Okay? All right. So let's start with the masks. Um, just recently, uh, many of you uh, had the opportunity to watch some of the Olympics. And it came to us quite quickly. Has there been a change in the mask rules? Uh, because it appeared, and it was the case, that many folks at the Olympics, the teams were uh, allowed to wear equipment longer than you would have thought. Uh, and there, there was a reason for that. Uh, mainly at the Olympics, and to be quite honest with you, the ball people were so good that and the equipment that they wear at that level was knee pads, elbow pads, things beyond the masks, that there was very little time for them to get that off without putting their team um, uh, in a bad situation because play was continuing so fast. 
So that tournament adapted to that a little bit, but the rules themselves have not changed. For USA Field Hockey and the NCAA, nothing has changed, okay? So you are still allowed to wear the smooth face mask anywhere on the field, whenever you choose to, okay? Um, including when taking, well, then you can also wear the metal grill face mask, okay? For defending penalty corners and taking the immediate free hit after the penalty corner when passing the ball to another player, okay? If you have a smooth face mask on, you can go wherever you want. If you have a metal grill face mask or goggles on, you must pass the ball immediately once you get possession of it. You cannot run off with it. You cannot do a long self start I mean, if you tap the ball and pass it, that's fine. With a metal grill face mask, you cannot put yourself in a position where you're going to engage another player. If you are, you will be penalized for that, okay? This is the rule. Everyone knows that you have to take the metal face mask off, okay? If you do not, and you're inside the 23 meter line, it will be a penalty corner against your team. So get rid of the mask per the rules as soon as possible, okay? Um, and here's the modification, that's at USA Field Hockey. Here's the modification for the NCAA, pretty much the same. A caged frame cannot be worn in the field of play. So that's the caged face mask. It's exactly what they're talking about. Um, we have no issues with the smooth ones. If a, the only issue would be if a player throws it off at the midfield line and they have to go retrieve it for a penalty corner, uh, you would be hit with delay of game because you haven't taken care of your responsibility with the mask, okay? We're not delaying penalty corners for people to chase their masks. Uh, but we don't care how the mask gets behind the goal. So if a player runs around, picks it up, gets it back there and they're well out of play and it's not an issue, we're just gonna continue to play and that should not be uh, be an issue, okay? This is a little bit of a change for the NFHS, the high school rules, okay? They are still allowed to wear goggles if they choose, and they are free to wear a face mask if they choose throughout the game, but they can only use the smooth face masks that are, that are a single color, fit face, flush to the face, the same ones most people are used to seeing. The high schools do not allow the metal grill face masks, okay? Uh, they felt they were too much like a helmet and could run into problems with that. So uh, this is the first year for this. I'm sure there'll be some discussions uh, and after some data comes in on how this all plays out for the NFHS, uh, um, you know, we'll see how it goes beyond there, okay? And a note for everyone, uh, when you have some of these face masks on, Field players are not permitted to conduct themselves in a manner which is dangerous to other players by taking advantage of the protective equipment they wear, okay? So just because your head or face is protected doesn't mean you get to act overly aggressive. So please maintain your composure, uh, coach your, your players, umpires, look out for some of this extra stuff like a player trying to run through or something like that. So, um, you know, we want to play the game properly uh, and safely. Okay, our next piece, we've already gotten some pieces or some uh, clips and some questions about players returning from suspension, okay? Uh, at USA Field Hockey and the NCAA, the player can return once their suspension is over. Uh, the clock is stopped at the NCAA for penalty corners. You don't have to wait for the penalty corner to to be over anymore. Um, so the bottom line is if there's two seconds left on their suspension, when the penalty corner is awarded, the penalty corner gets set up, the ball gets inserted two seconds later, or the, the whistle gets blown two seconds later, the player can come on. What will not happen, and it will be delay of game, if the inserter decides they're gonna try to wait five or six seconds so that player can get onto the circle or get into a defensive position. That is not happening. Uh, any delay of the insertion of the penalty corner will be penalized properly, okay? Um, and then at the NFHS level, all right, uh, at least for this year, and I'm sure there'll be some discussions on this, but the suspended player must follow the substitution rules. So therefore, 
they can they're allowed to come in and re-enter the game once the insertion happens on the penalty corner. Okay. At this point, there's no need to blow the whistle for umpires to start the penalty corner. They haven't done it up until now. Just going to leave things the way they are. Um, but once the insertion happens, uh, substitutions can happen at the NFHS level and uh, the player on the sideline uh, can come in. OK, uh, the clock's running. So, <clears throat> you know, if there's 10 seconds left on their suspension, it takes 30 seconds to set up the penalty corner. Again, once the insertion goes in, that player is able to go in and then any subsequent corner they're allowed to be part of. Um, the idea being we don't want the suspended player out any longer than necessary. Uh, and again, I'm sure there'll, there'll be some discussions on this uh, going into next year. OK. Uh, Casey, any questions on those two yet? Um, yes, we have a few questions on the face mask. Can we st take a step back really quick? Go. Yep. OK, perfect. Um, Brian wants to know, can an attacking player put on an approved face mask on a penalty corner? For the NCAA and the, um, uh, the and the NFHS, yes. The answer is players can wear them whenever they want, okay? But the game will not be delayed to put those on, just like uh, on a penalty corner, okay? If you're going to put them on and take them off, must be done quickly. There's nothing at either one of those levels preventing a player from doing it. Okay, and then are there parameters as to where the players throw off the mask, especially the cage type of mask? OK, there is no parameters as to where they have to go off. They have to go off of the field. If the ball hits them while they're in the circle, it will be a penalty corner. If it stops the ball from going in the goal, it will be a penalty stroke. Um, there is no, you know, it. well, the, the cage masks must be worn mainly inside the circle anyway. So the assumption is they're going to go off the end line. Um, if they happen to go off the sideline, that's not a problem either. But you're going to have to retrieve it at that point. So to answer your question, there's no specific area that the masks have to go off the, the field of play. OK, and then Joff wants to know, can players wear metal eye guards for NFHS? Metal eye guards. I've never heard of metal eye guards. They are allowed to wear goggles. And if they are made of metal, if that's what you're talking about, Josh, uh, they can be worn. Just as I have the slide up here that says goggles may be worn. Um, as long as there's no sharp edges on them and they are not um, a danger to other folks because of those sharp edges, they're allowed to be worn at the National Federation level. Goggles at the NCAA and USA field hockey levels are considered the same as a cage mask. So you are not allowed to wear those in the field of play uh, for USA field hockey and uh, the NCAA. All right, awesome. Um, let me see. What is the appropriate time for considering it a delay on the substitute on the corner? So substitution on the corner, what is the appropriate time for calling the considering a, of a delay? Okay, well, there is no substitution on a corner, okay? Um, for the NCAA level in USA field hockey, okay? The corners must go off as normal almost immediately at the NCAA level in USA field hockey where the whistle gets blown for the penalty corner to start. It's like a penalty stroke. It should go in that same time frame. We are not counting three, five, six seconds. If the umpire feels it's being delayed, they're going to be required to deal with it. OK, at the NFHS level, the player can't come in anyway until the ball is inserted. So there's really no benefit to delay there. Uh, we don't want this to turn into a gamesmanship issue. We definitely want the game to go on as normal. OK, so. Let's um, instruct our players and umpires. You be aware of that. Um, you know, players like to walk up. They like to set themselves. That's all fine and dandy. But as long as it's going off normal. As as they always have been for, I'm going to say at least last my 40 years, uh, everything should be good. OK, awesome. And that is um, we'll cover the rest at the end. OK, all right. OK, um, so we talked about returning from suspension. OK, uh, the suspensions must be served in full. All right, at every level. So if someone happens to come in early at the NCAA and USA field hockey, 
First of all, the player will have to go, player who came in early has to go back and finish their time. And the captain is the person that receives a card for too many players on the field. Okay. This is not a green card offense. It's a five minute yellow for the first offense. If it happens again, you go to 10, like we normally do in our card progressions at those two levels. Okay. If a goal is scored during the time that they have too many people on the field, it will not be counted if it is discovered before the restart of play. If the center pass happens and then it's discovered, that goal cannot be taken away, but the player will have to go back into the sin bin and the card is still applicable in that, okay? Uh, at the NFHS level, the uh, suspension also gets served in full, but the head coach is the one that receives the card for too many players, and that's through their card progression, all right? So depending on how the game has gone, but hopefully we don't get to that, all right? And with both of these above, we know at the high school level, we mainly have, I'm going to, no disrespect, but high school students or team managers at the table. And even at the NCAA level, and sometimes at USA Field Hockey, we have volunteers or we have folks from the uh, sports information department or um, folks that just, uh, 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 sports folks within the college that come out to these things. So mistakes are made, unfortunately, okay? But we cannot rely on that personnel 100% of the time to release a player to go in early, okay? So in both of these above, USA Field Hockey, NCAA, and the NFHS, teams have a responsibility to know when the suspension is over so that the player may re-enter the game, all right? And we're not talking about a second or two if, if somebody happens to get in on that, okay, De depending on when the umpire restarts the game. We're talking about the ones that get on the field and get involved in the play or even get onto the field for any substantial amount of time, okay? That is materially affecting the play because they're either drawing a defender, they've either touched the ball, um, they're getting into a position or they're defending, whatever the case may be, all right? So, we want the teams to have some responsibility in this and just to know it. And the same thing for the umpires. Don't just um, give the card, move on, and think it's all going to be handled 100% of the time by the sideline. Because the first time that somebody realizes a mistake was made and you don't have control of it or you don't have an idea of what happened, there's going to be a problem. And you may never be able to get back to where you need to be. So, we are recommending, even though this is done at the NFHS level, all right, even though it is not required to stop the clock to give a card at USA Field Hockey in the NCAA, for control purposes, we are recommending that umpires briefly stop the clock, make sure that the table knows the card that you've given, be sure to show the player the card and the table the card and indicate if, it, if you're using yellow, whether it's five or 10 minutes, take the time to do it because the game is held up anyway. It's only going to take about five seconds, but it's important for everyone to understand the parameters of this because when it does go wrong, it goes wrong bad. Okay. So please take the time to do that. And then everyone, including coaches on the sideline, the fans, the television, the streaming, all of those things are important in their game today, and everyone needs to understand what's going on. So umpires, please hold on. To, do your part to make this as clear as possible. And also we ask the teams, uh, the coaching staffs on the sideline to be aware of when the player can go back in and we handle those things properly. Any questions at this point, Case? Nope, not on that. Okay, all right. Go. Um, the next thing I just want to briefly talk about is sideline demeanor. So, Casey, you can put the camera on me if you would be so kind. All right, they should be seeing you now. Okay, all right. Thank you very much. Um, even in this short week, we've already had some issues with some things from the sideline. So, without getting on my soapbox, okay, we have a good number, and I mean a good number of young umpires coming through the system, okay? 
It's going to take them some time to be able to get to the uppermost levels, whether it's high school, the di different divisions in college, and even through the club system at USA Field Hockey. Okay. So all of that being said, we need the administrations of the teams to allow them to do their job. The any interference from the sideline, any interference from the sideline should be dealt with by the umpires. Okay. Each group, USA Field Hockey and the NCAA have their protocols. So does the NFHS. Okay. I've already gotten a clip of a coach going onto the field with their arms raised, creating the attention and interrupting the game. Okay. We don't need it. We don't want it. Okay. We understand passion. We understand emotion. But when it goes to affect the game, the umpires are being instructed to deal with it. All right. And I don't think any administration or team personnel wants to be going in front of their AD for any actions from the sideline. All right. If everybody does their part, nobody gets reprimanded, carded, whatever you want to call it. Umpires don't go into a game saying, I'm giving this coach a card today or I'm going to mess this game up. They are doing the best that they can. We need that respect and understanding from the sidelines. And then hopefully everyone learns, everyone gets better. The right team will win and we're playing the game that we all love. Okay. All right, Casey, you can go back to my presentation. All right, switching now. Okay. Are there any questions at this point, Case, before I get into rules and videos? Um, we do have a suspension question. Do you want me to shoot that one to you? Go. Yes. Okay. Um, for clarification, when it is discovered a player leaves a suspension too early, example 15 seconds, does the player get sent back to serve the remaining time in addition to the card that is given to the captain or head coach? Correct. That is correct. Yes. The player must serve their full suspension. The other card to the captain is the coach is for their misconduct of not uh, holding up to their responsibilities based on the rules. The coach is responsible for illegal substitutions and all that at the NFHS. The captain's responsible for it at USA Field Hockey and the NCAA per the rules. There's no modifications for that when it comes to that part of the rules. All right, perfect. That was it. Okay. All right. All right. So now uh, I'm sorry about the slides. I, I don't like just reading slides. So we're going to get into some videos here uh, and a few things. Um, want to make sure that we um, get ourselves uh, in a mind frame to um, uh, to be consistent, okay? So when we talk about intentional over the end line, and we're mainly talking about the defense inside their 23 meter line, can happen from anywhere, but inside their 23 meter line, it happens mostly, okay? If the attack has to be aware of the end line, so does the defense, okay? This isn't, well, I can tackle the same on the end line like I would tackle in midfield because there's no chance of playing the ball. And this is one of the things that we've lacked in understanding over time um, because it, everybody thinks they can do the same thing. Well, the attacker can't do the same thing, so neither can the defender. So both have to be aware of the end line. When the ball is played directly over the end line and there's no chance of anybody to play the ball, it should be deemed intentional. That can be a jab, that can be a sweep, okay? Um, the difficult ones are when somebody goes to block tackle and the ball might deflect over the end line. If it's a legitimate block tackle and it deflects over the end line, that's not a problem, okay? They attempted the block tackle, all right? And some of the angles of the stick can be varied and all that. But if there's a sweep or a movement, that that ball is going to go that way and no one has a chance to play it because it goes over the end line, then it should be considered a, uh, a as being done intentional. And this, no matter, this should be the process, no matter where the action occurs. We have had trouble with umpires having the feeling that because it happened out near the sideline or outside the dotted line, that those are not necessarily considered penalty corners. The rule is the rule. Intentionally playing by the defense over the end line is a penalty corner. It's been in the rule book for years. 
There is no variance to that. If the umpire feels it's intentional, again, it must be given as a penalty corner. I've pulled some from the Olympic uh, briefing as well, but I think they show a few things that that we're gonna we can talk about. So inside the final few seconds, Sam Ward. Right here, you're going to see one of the white players do a sweep. Trying to make something happen. A chance here, perhaps. And a penalty corner. Right into the net. Although they're surely going to. And the number three is the guy arguing with the umpire. And he's the one that did the sweep. Okay. It's exactly what we're talking about. That the uh, player had no we're chance of playing the, the ball. given for playing the ball. Had no chance of playing the ball. He's asking for something else, but they show this again. This sweep over the end line can be nothing else. Okay. I think this one's one of the more obvious ones. But we have seen some of these being given as a long hit as well. That ball can go nowhere else. Okay. They show it a thousand times, which is good. Okay, here's another one. <clears throat> Let me make sure that the sound's turned down on this. Okay, which you should be able to see. And this is one that I was talking about of, it can happen anywhere, okay? Even though this one is out a little bit off the end line, this ball is going nowhere. The player in white had no chance to play it. The player in black had no chance to play it any further. It's the same type of sweep, just happens to be a little bit farther out. Okay, so this is what we were talking about, about anywhere on the pitch. So please be aware of that. Okay, here's one in a high school game that is a little bit more difficult. And it's going to require some judgment and positioning on the umpire's parts to be able to get this. Okay, the ball's going to come in, get behind the goalkeeper, unfortunately, and then you're going to have a player in white who's playing defense try to take the ball out. And as you're going to see, okay, it goes over the end line. Now, the guidances that you have in the NFHS book and other umpire books is if the player attempts to get the ball out towards the sideline, and it doesn't quite make the sideline and goes over the end line, you wouldn't necessarily consider that intentional. Okay, this one is really close and might even have gone off the stick of the, of the player in black, but these are the difficult ones for umpires to do. Okay, the thing I'm going to say about this from an umpire standpoint, and this is crucial as umpires make decisions, is what's wrong with this picture? And the answer is, the umpire isn't in it, okay? That's just a piece of umpiring for those, but the umpires have to get down here into this position to see these things. So from this one, it's almost a 50-50. You can argue it one way or the other. I'm sure folks will, all right? The umpire's got to decide, did this player try to get it out towards the sideline or did she go more towards the end line? If it's more towards the end line and nobody can play it, it's a penalty corner. If he felt the attempt was to get it out wide, then it could be a long hit. Not the easiest decision, okay? But it's the decision that they have to make, okay? Here's one that's a simple tackle that would happen in the midfield, but again, <laughs> given the proximity, that's the jab we're talking about that is a simple jab that is definitely used in the midfield. OK, and it's not a problem. But again, if this player can't go anywhere but down the end line, this player has to make an attempt to play the ball properly. Oh, sorry about that. Sorry, technical difficulties. I'll get it. There we go. Now what you're going to see is the player do the jab and the ball go directly over the end line. Okay, 
There could be a debate that the white player touched it again, but I don't know that. I think it might have been out. But that's the jab we're talking about. It's outside the circle, in between the dotted line and the hard line circle. That is still a penalty corner because no one had the chance to play it beyond that. All right. So the defense does have to play the ball properly. Here's another sweep. Okay. There's all kinds of variances to this. There's one that's, that sweeps. And unfortunately, you can see the umpire kind of giving a long hit on this. This is the same sweep as the guy did in the earlier video. Okay. The ball can only go one spot. Umpires must be strong on this. Okay. Without opinion as to whether they would have or wouldn't have gotten the ball in the circle. That is not part of the judgment. The judgment is, did they send it over intentional or did they not? Okay. Any questions so far, Casey, on that? Nope, not on that. Okay. I'll give them just a second as I do this one. Okay. I, we did get a question already this season about the possibility of a penalty stroke um, with the goalkeeper behind a defender. Okay. And the thing I want to say here is it is not 100% automatic that it is not a stroke just because the goalkeeper is physically behind a player, okay? This was the best video I could find of this, but in the grand scheme of things, I hopefully be able to show it. The ball comes across, as you just saw, and if I can grab it, I will. Okay, the ball comes across and the player sweeps, and of course the ball goes up high, all right? So this pretty much should be deemed dangerous on the player hitting the ball because the player was in proper defending position. She was waiting for the ball to come across, okay? But if the umpire saw this as a possibility of a penalty stroke, the decision the umpire has to make is, could the goalie have played the ball based on where it was going? If this ball was going over here and this player was on the post, or up from the post, but the goalkeeper happens to be a little bit behind. If the goalkeeper could not have reached the ball, it would still be a penalty stroke. If the, in the umpire's judgment, the goalkeeper could have reached the ball, then it would have been, um, it, it could be a penalty corner or it could be dangerous coming out, okay? If this player was on the post over here or out here and the goalkeeper couldn't reach it, it would be a stroke. All right. Everybody knows the stroke rules, <clears throat> but the, the idea here was it is not a 100 percent given that it cannot be a penalty stroke just because the goalkeeper's behind. The judgment of the umpire is could they have played the ball or not? And that's what they have to decide and not an easy decision either. OK, especially when things happen so fast in our game. All right. Uh, any questions up on the board, Casey? Nope, not about this. Okay. Okay. Before we get into aerial balls, which has the most videos, what kind of questions do you have, Casey? All right. So we have one. Um, goalkeepers are walking up to the attacking team's huddle on a penalty corner when time is out. How should umpires handle this situation? Umpires should see that they're even attempting to walk up, okay? And the umpire should pretty much intercept them. That's why umpires have to keep their eyes on the circle and everything associated with the play. That is misconduct, okay? So if you see it happening, the umpire should step in and say, no, we're not going to do this. And if they continue to do it or they don't heed your warning, send them off. That is misconduct. It's inappropriate. It's unsportsmanlike. All right, and then on a penalty corner, can defenders wear ice hockey gloves? These do not do not seem to meet the guidelines in the rule book, yet most colleges use them. Okay, great question. Uh, since we do not have the availability to have a box to put these in, by rule, all gloves should fit in the box that can be created and is in the rule book. It's a certain number of centimeters by centimeters and so high, okay? All gloves should fit into that. Um, unfortunately, as umpires, you're not going to be able to uh, measure those. 
All right. Um, the best that I can tell you is if you think they are too big and you have the availability to measure the meaning, bringing a centimeter tape or whatever, and they don't meet the standard, they can be prevented from wearing them. But I think that's going to be rare. And to be quite honest with you, some of these ice hockey gloves actually do fit into the box. Um, uh, and some of the lacrosse gloves actually do fit into the box set for this, okay? And as we're talking about those and we talked about the masks, we're, we're not overly concerned about some of this stuff coming off in the short term, but, um, and um, believe me, players don't necessarily wanna play with those gloves on in the field and all that kind of stuff. So we're gonna basically deal with all of the equipment the same we are with the masks and uh, we will go from there, all right? All right, and then last one I have in here for now. Um, Lou said, during preseason scrimmages, several coaches said they thought the rules were changing to do away with the coin toss and the walkout. Is this real or is that a myth? Okay, well, number one, it's not a myth. The NCAA put out guidelines, and I believe they are posted on Arbiter, the NCAA site, and the NCAA site. It's the same COVID protocols we had last year. Now, I understand that last year, Mainly it was just division one. So we're now getting back into division two and three. Totally understand that. These um, guidelines are out there. The idea was no coin toss. You send one player up to the two umpires, the visiting team chooses, and we move on. Okay, if they take the ball, the other team decides what side. If they take the side, the other team gets the ball. Okay, this is to prevent people to get in close proximity, stepping in, looking at the coin, still COVID related issues. Um, if this came, I'm assuming this question probably came from a coach, which is fine. I will make sure that Kirsten at the NFHCA has the document and we will make sure that gets distributed across the coaches. I do believe it's in the NCAA manual or the, um, uh, I don't know that they added it to the modifications though. So bottom line is we don't want to be doing coin tosses and that would go for shootouts. Okay. Anything that requires a shootout, the visiting team chooses and we're done. Okay. And we go from there. That's the guidance that's in the document. And again, we will get that sent out as soon as possible. I've just made my note of that. Okay. Awesome. Thanks to you. That's all I have for now. That's all you have for now. Okay. Um, Yes, I'm still here making myself another note. That's perfect. And thank you so much for the question. That's great. Because if that information isn't out, we want to make sure that it does get out. Okay. All right. Uh, on to everyone's favorite subject, aerial balls. I noticed in my uh, uh, first slide where I had everything, I had a thing in there about shadowing and I didn't get anything into the presentation on that. I think most people have shadowing down. Um, there was no need to get in that. All free hits inside the 23 meter line are the same anyway. So I'm um, uh, not too worried about that. <clears throat> so I apologize for that little mistype. Uh, let's get on to the uh, aerial balls. Okay. The first thing that I want to make sure that everyone understands, deflections do not fall under the aerial ball rules. Any deflection that goes high over top of anyone. Okay. There's no intent to try to pass it to someone when that happens. It's pretty much uncontrolled and uh, an accident for the most part, all right? So there's no way to have somebody give five yards, um, be back five yards, who knows where it's going to go, all right? So it does not fall under the aerial ball rules and it's a deflection. Um, players are allowed, it happens. And if it is called as dangerous, where it's coming down between a couple players, as it may, as it will here, the free hit is taken where the deflection started, okay? So, just as any deflection going into the circle, if it happens just outside the circle and it goes to waist height, screaming across the circle, and there's two players there that it's dangerous to, we give the free hit outside the circle where it was lifted. It's the same thing in those situations for the ones that go high overhead. And here is a good example. Okay, the umpire didn't feel this was dangerous because the uh, there was only players in black uniforms 
inside the circle, it was coming down, and the player in white stayed back. But this was the best example I have that this ball gets deflected out here. Okay? The ball gets high up in the air. There's the possibility of the ball coming down here amongst players. If that's how the umpire saw it, then in turn, the free hit would be out here. Okay? This player in white happens to back away. The player can play the ball safely. Everybody's under control, so we can play on in this instance. But if it's crowded, we want to get it. We want to get it when the ball is up here in the air, recognizing, recognizing that the ball is in the air. We don't want sticks playing the ball as it's coming down. And do not wait until two players go to challenge it as it's coming down to blow this. It's too late. That's how folks get hurt. And that's not what we want. So the free hit would happen out here. Different than an intentionally raised aerial ball. Okay? All right. The next one, and some of you might have seen these. I think we used some of these in our advanced umpire class last year. <clears throat> but they're still good. And uh, they, they give us the best example of what we're looking for. One of the issues we've had, and it's been discussed quite heavily, is when a player goes to receive the ball, but they don't control it in their immediate space, and the ball deflects away. <clears throat> Too many times, umpires have been given the free hit to the team who was trying to initially receive the ball, <coughs> but the ball is so far away that the other team did nothing wrong and they're being penalized for that. So I want to show you a couple things here to try to ho hopefully clear that up. This ball is going to go up. I'm going to try to run this in slow motion. We can see it better, okay? As this goes up, you see the player in white with her stick over the head. She's getting ready to play the ball. She has a player behind her who is not a problem. She has a player to her right who in the estimation of this angle, is five meters away. So we don't have a problem. But she deflects it towards that player. So what the umpire has to decide is, does the player in red come into the five yards or does the ball get deflected to her that she can play it legally? Because she does take a step, but it looks like she's going up the field versus into the player. When this ball is received, the player in red has done nothing wrong. So if it gets deflected to her and anything turns dangerous, it's like any other deflection. The player who deflected it is the one causing the danger. In this situation, the ball comes over and they play it and the umpire actually gives it to the team in white. From this angle and looking at the player in red who was five meters away, this either should have played on because I think the ball is on the ground. This could have played on. The red player did nothing wrong, but yet the ball was given to the team in white. So umpires and coaches, be aware of that. Okay? I'll let it run straight time, or full, time, uh, full speed rather. Okay? And then, there you go. Okay? Okay, here's another one that gets deflected away. This one's just a little, oh, I'm sorry, wrong one. Uh, let me go back again. Hold on. My apologies. That one. This one. Okay, that's the same one. Thought I had another one. Okay, all right. So, if a player's five meters away, they're good to go. All right. Here's one with a 50-50 ball that is very difficult, okay? But if it's being considered 50-50, that means it is not clear and needs to be blown. Okay. I'll run it again in slow motion. As the ball goes up, we don't have a problem. And then the ball bounces, as I believe you can see. Okay. And then it bounces again. And at this point, you basically have two players trying to play the ball in the air somewhere between knee and waist height, okay? That is not clear. 
The team that put it up is still responsible for this ball until it is received, controlled, and on the ground. So when it bounces like this, these two players, with the attempt to play the ball, this actually should have been blown probably just after the second bounce when you see two players going 50-50, and it should have been given to the team in the dark uniforms because the team in red is the one that put it up. All right. Now, this can be an angle thing. Sometimes it's difficult to see the angles on this, but this is where umpires in this briefing, I want to make it perfectly clear that even though this happens in the umpire side down that line, in your pregame discussions, you must talk about how you're going to manage these. Because I think we all can see here that where this umpire is, which is not a bad position, is going to have a lot of difficulty seeing who's going to get to this ball or that this is even a 50-50. So this is something umpires must talk about. The idea of worrying about these things like we used two years ago, calling in somebody's area and all that. As long as this is taken care of in your pre-game discussions, these games will go off much better and aerial balls will be handled much better because I think everyone would agree that the umpire on this near side will have a better angle of this play. Okay. Here's another one that goes into space and not controlled. I'll let this run full time or full speed first. Where the ball bounces and she plays it. And this player comes in immediately. Immediately. Okay. This is what this is one of the things that folks are starting to look at now. All right. That's practically misconduct. She knows the player has the ball. She knows the rule. When she collects that ball, we'll even give her the benefit of doubt that this is five meters away. But she is not making any attempt to allow this player to receive and control the ball and get it on the ground. Okay? So, that being said, the players need to know the rules as well. This is not done by accident. She's trying to get to the ball. And therefore, even if she's, the, the girl controls it relatively well for a ball over her head, it's right in front of her, and this player continues to run in and now influences the play and forces the, the uh, player in white backwards. Okay? This should have been given as soon as the player in red, as soon as the player in red breaches the five yards. Okay? Right about here, this should have been blown, shut down, given to the team in white. Okay? The player in red breached the rules. Okay? Here's one that ends up not clear because the ball bounces and you now have two players, same thing, 50-50. And as you can see, the umpire gets this and goes in the right direction. The only thing that I really want to show here, and it's so important to control of the game, is the fact that if you see this and watch this closely, the ball is bouncing and right about here, it's going to be pretty obvious that these players, that nobody's clear to receive it. And it's not until the ball gets here that the umpire puts the whistle to the mouth and points out. We want to get these things earlier because once that's understood, you will see the players adapt to it and know that they can't come in and they're going to start staying away a little bit. Because if you really look at this, the team in white actually gained about 30 yards, 35 yards, and teams don't like to give that up. Okay. All right, so if the umpire gets this early, the player in white's going to go, you know what, I can't get in there and I'm going to tackle her property and the game flows nicely, okay? I will say, and many of you, I'm sure, watched a good bit of the Olympics. The aerial balls in the Olympics were done phenomenally. They were not perfect. Umpires made mistakes. Teams made mistakes. But the games flowed so well, and this is all part of it. If the umpires get it early and the players understand the parameters of it, the game can continue to play. It's not about who can just get there first. It's about it's about it being clear. And if it's not clear, it needs to be blown as soon as possible. Once that understanding is there, things should be able to 
flow quite nicely. Okay. Okay. In in recent times, they've added the allowance for an interception as long as there's no challenge and it's away from the player or the player who might think they're going to receive the ball. Here's a good example of it from the same angle that we had before. This ball goes up and bounces here. And then the player in the dark uniform actually gets to the ball two or three meters in front of the player in white, and there's no challenge for the ball whatsoever. The player in the dark uniform easily picks the ball up. And I will run that slower so you can see it. With the shadow, it wasn't so easy. But right here, the ball bounces, as you can see, the ball bouncing, all right? The player in the dark uniform is a, a meter or two in front. The player in white is waiting for the ball, so they actually create a little bit more separation. And this player can intercept the ball without a problem. This is perfectly legal, all right? If there's a challenge where two sticks are going to be in there on the ball, then it's not clear and it goes against the team to put it up. That is a judgment decision of the umpires. And again, from this angle <clears throat> and knowing the umpires' positions, this is something umpires must talk about in their pregame discussion. This is the best way for aerial balls to be handled properly and clearly understood by the teams and the fans and the stream and the announcers so that um, we get rid of the opinions. We try to make them as black and white as we possibly can for clarity for everyone, okay? Okay, here's one more that I have. Okay, and when we talk about an interception, when we talk about an interception, if it's going to look like two players are going to have their sticks in the air, this has to be blown early. And you're going to see it come up here. Right there. You have a player in black who's actually turning her head because she's worried about the stick of the yellow player. All right. And the ball, even at, if we back this up or get it to where we need to have it, I'm sorry for my technical issues. Right about here at the 20 meter mark that they're talking about, you have two players running into the ball. This is where that should be blown. Okay, it's unclear who's going to get this ball. All right, the umpire I think is a bit low, but should have had a pretty good um, angle of this. All right, it gets blown here. Those sticks do not get up in the air. No one has a chance of being hit in the head by a stick or the ball deflecting. These things have to be done early, okay? I, you're hearing me say that a lot during this aerial ball presentation. That is the key to keeping control of aerial balls. From the coaching perspective, yes, some might get blown too early and they might seem wrong, okay? But we are much better being safe and getting people to try to judge this properly and get it early than we are waiting for somebody to get it in the head or the ball in the head or a deflection. It's all about player safety. So that's why we want to make sure that these things do get blown early, okay? The umpire actually played through this, which in discussions afterwards was not a good idea, okay? All right, and here's one <coughs> that actually goes in the wrong direction. The ball bounces and the player in white was waiting for it, okay? When this ball bounces, and it's quite obvious it's going to the player in white, the player in the dark uniform just keeps coming in and coming in, and now you have two sticks playing it in the air, all right? The player in white was the obvious receiver. If the player in the dark uniform could have intercepted that here or even here, fine, we, and knock it away, we might have played on. But she doesn't. She continues to come into the player. And this should have been a free hit to the team in white. This is one of the ones where it's attacker to attacker. And too many times, <coughs> excuse me, umpires give this against the attacking team, even though they have every right to be in that position and play the ball. Okay. 
Okay, Casey, any questions? There's got to be questions on the aerial balls. I actually don't have any so far. <laughs> we can't be doing that well. Okay, <laughs> we'll give them a few minutes to put them in. Um, okay, the, the last video that I have, and again, we're almost up on our hour. These things go so fast when you're doing them, um, is an aerial dribble, okay? Uh, especially at the high school level, players love to do this. Uh, most people stand back and go, oh, she is so good. And then that player who's, who's doing an aerial dribble ends up getting all the calls. But in the perspective and by the rules, <clears throat> this player gets the ball up very nicely. Thank you very much. And she makes her way up the field. There is no, no problem with this so far whatsoever. Okay. But eventually, somebody's going to come in and try to play the ball. Okay. This player isn't quite there yet to play the ball. She's not getting her stick in. Now it comes in, okay? This is no different than the ball popping up between two players. The player in white is not doing anything overly aggressive. She's coming in to play the ball under control, okay? And when now she actually sees her player coming and backs away. Now the ball is taken directly in to the player in white. This should have been blown against the team in light blue because this is becomes dangerous by somebody trying to play the ball at waist height. And what we're trying to get folks to understand is if we get into this situation, just like any ball that pops up in between two players on a deflection where two players try to play it at waist height, we blow it against the team that put it up 99.9% .9 of the time. If a player with an aerial dribble puts themselves in this position, they are the one creating danger. And that's the one that needs to be blown against uh, the player who puts it up. Okay. Okay. Questions we have so far, Case? All right. We did get some aerial questions coming through. Love it. Okay, we'll start with this one. If the ball had not been bouncing, would the 50-50 ball be allowed to play on? It was the first 50-50 video. Uh, if the ball had not been bouncing and got down to ground level or close to very close to ground level where you would normally allow a couple players to play the ball, the answer is yes. Okay, but it has to be very close to the ground, not absolutely on the ground in those situations. OK, and as long as the ball is down really low, we're talking ankle or a little bit above, players can play the ball quite safely. In that video, the, the ball was still up knee height, maybe even a little bit higher. That's where we don't want them trying to challenge for the ball. And the whole idea of, the, of this and the aerial ball rule is they're trying to eliminate these challenges while the ball is in the air and two players trying to play the ball in the air at the same time. Because nothing good can happen out of that in most cases. All right, awesome. Another aerial question. <laughs> On the mishandled aerial by a receiving attacker player that bounces three yards away towards a defender who is safely five yards away, the receiver tries to recover it while the defender tries to steal it. I would think the benefit of the doubt is to the receiver to try to recover and the foul is on the defender, but you said otherwise. Can you clarify? No, I didn't mean to say otherwise, so thank you very much if that's the way it came across. <clears throat> Here's the bottom line. <coughs> if that defender is on five, and they're five meters away, when the player goes to, when the player goes to receive the ball, try to get myself back here. I, not that one. I think it's this one. I'm hoping I'm on the right video. Okay. Uh, wrong one. Wrong one. Here we go. I'm hoping this is the one you're talking about. Where the player plays the ball and the player is five meters away. <clears throat> okay. If this player in red, let me see if I can stop it here. If this player in red stays on five and the ball comes to her, she has done nothing wrong. But this player in trying to control it has to be given the space and the area to try to control it. So if this player steps in, say, say this ball goes three meters like you said, 
and this player comes in too. They did this player in red did not give her the five meters to receive, control, and get the ball on the ground. So the fault would be here with the player in red. What I said here was if this player appears to be running up the field and not impeding the five, then this could have played on. All right. But if this this player here, if they are on five and this player does not control it cleanly, they do not get to come rushing in to play the ball. There's no benefit of the doubt. If this player breaks the five meter rule, then they are at fault. If this player has the ball and can't control it and it gets out to five meters, if there's any danger associated with it, it's on the player in white. If there's no danger associated with it, they're able to play on. I hope that clarifies the question. All right, perfect. Let me see. OK, so on the air dribble examples, does it matter if the defender moves into into the space where the attacking air dribbler is heading? In other words, there is no right free, no right of free passage. Absolutely correct. Just like we don't have any right of free passage in any other thing. It's not in the rules anywhere. The player with the ball must play it safely. Um, uh, so, so the answer is there is no free right of passage, and that's that'll just take me right to what I said about this slide to begin with. Is so many people see a see a, a well skilled player do this in the aerial dribble, and they think, oh, she is so good, and she's allowed to do this, and this is impressive, and they give her the right of passage. There is no right of passage. She creates the danger because players are trying to play the ball here. It's against the player that put it up. So I can't make that any clearer. No right of passage. All right. And then a player aerial dribbling will need to put the ball on the ground before the defenders come in to tackle, correct? That is the safest place to do it if you want to maintain possession of the ball. OK, it's a judgment decision. It's not playing distance because playing distance is can be a stick length and an arm length, which can be two meters away or two yards away. And the player's not even attempting to play it at that point. But if they get in too close, this is again, if we if we kind of equate this a little bit to the aerial ball where we don't want two sticks trying to play the ball while it's up in the air in close proximity. OK, so umpires, if you see this developing, get to it as early as possible. All right, awesome. And then in the video, I believe when the player was coming in to create a foul on that last aerial, how do how does a umpire verbalize that type of foul? It's still a five meter violation. OK, so you just put your hand up with the five because they came into the five as the player was trying to control the ball. So you, you can say five, put your hand up five. You don't really have to say anything because that is the, that's the same foul that, that um, people call anyway, or that that's part of the rule. If they breach the five yards, it's just a simple five. Okay, awesome. Um, if an aerial is sent to a dangerous reception, is the penalty still placed at reception versus the point of lift? Yes. Yes, because and it's not necessarily because of the danger is down there. <clears throat> it's because somebody where the ball is falling violated the rules as they're written. Either somebody wasn't in clear open space or someone violated the five yards. OK, that's your two basically, and that's why it's taken where it comes down. We are not waiting for danger to happen with the, on an aerial ball coming down to blow it. It is too late. The rule is written so that, and I actually can can do that. Hold on, because I pulled all of these up. Okay. The rule is written right here. Okay. Must not approach within five meters of an opponent with a raised ball until it's received, controlled, and on the ground. We talked about the interception. Okay. The initial receiver has the right to the ball. And if it's not clear who the initial one is, that's the 50 50s, then the team that put it up is responsible for it. This is the important part right here that I just highlighted is they want to ensure player safety to eliminate the contest for a falling raised ball. 
so the two players aren't playing the ball while it is in the air. All right, awesome. Um, if an aerial ball is deflected into a teammate, is there a foul? No. I mean, it, they might be using their body to stop it, but so that could be a foul. But if it gets deflected to a teammate who cleanly receives it, no problem. You can continue to play on. Because it right. takes the opponent. You don't, and a teammate, if they're within five, nobody's really worried about that. But unfortunately, very, and I think everybody would agree, very rarely would you have two teammates waiting for an aerial ball without an opponent within close proximity. But just to answer your question, short answer is no, it's not a foul unless it hits their body. Perfect. Um, and then following up on the coin toss, um, does this still occur under the NFHS rules? Seems like we were talking about the NCAA and higher. That is correct. The, N the NFHS still has their rules for a coin toss. These were guidances at the NCAA level um, to, because of COVID. Um, and everybody's been struggling with COVID, but, uh, and there's still some things coming out. That's why the NCAA decided for this year through this 2021 season to hold on to that. But it is not a rule or a guidance for the uh, NFHS. Okay, and then going along with that, uh, we never address the walkout or lineups in the anthem. That's entirely up to the, to the uh, it's not addressed, it's not changed, so that process is not changed, okay? The only thing they would want you to do, I believe there's something in the guidance that talks about socially distancing with each other, okay? So you just want to keep your spacing if you're going to do a walkout. Okay, awesome. Um, and then knee pads on a defensive penalty corner, do they need to come off by a specific time? Um, they, if we're getting to general questions, Case, if you want to put the camera on me, you can. Yep, it's already on you. You're all good. Oh, there you go. So you caught me with my glasses. Uh, <laughs> uh, the knee, the knee pads, <clears throat> they need to come off as soon as possible. Okay. Uh, again, you can't act any differently, like taking bigger chances. Um, that, that was one of the biggest things that did happen with the Olympics because the ball was put back in place so fast. Players had to decide, do I take these off and allow a player to come in on my goalkeeper or get an advantageous position? We want umpires to work with players to get them off as soon as possible, but we are not going to be overzealous about it, given the time frame. If there's time to get them off, coaches, we, we really, really need you to instruct your players and work with them to get them off as soon as possible. We don't need equipment laying around on the field because it is temporary. The straps come off, they come out of their socks, the knee pads that slide down into their socks or elbow pads, whatever. And we don't need that all over the field because now it becomes dangerous. So we want them off as soon as possible. The masks are an easy fix. It's pulling them off and throwing them off. Okay, the, the uh, other pads, it might take a little bit longer. All right, and then in the video that the official gave to the wrong team, or the one that the official gave to the wrong team, the offense was the clear receiver and the defense came with within five minutes of the stick up. Could that have been a corner or a deliberate foul? It could have been. I actually have that video up here, okay? Um, it could be. We know that... There are some cases that players are breaking this down, okay? Because if you really look at this, this player, um, if this ball gets to the player in white, they almost have a run on the goalkeeper, okay? Deliberate fouls on this are very, very difficult. You need to be 100% sure as an umpire that a player did this deliberately, okay? And that would be one without any regard. This player actually tries to play the ball and she does breach the rule. So for me, watching this one, give her the benefit of the doubt she's trying to play the ball, all right, and she impedes the five yards. The ones where they just run right in, throw their stick in, back up, those are the ones that their body language will pretty much tell you uh, whether they've done it intentionally or not. Very difficult decision. Don't be giving away penalty corners for intentional things like this unless you are 100% sure. There's always going to be a debate on it, but umpires, you have to have it sure in your mind 
that it was done intentionally. All right, we're getting to um, our last few questions here. Uh, Fran wants to ask, can you address the NFHS edge of the stick? Ah, OK, uh, am I back on case? Yep, I'll send you there now. OK, thank you. OK, <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion of the rule in the NFHS book where they defined what a sweep was and the use of the edge of the stick, OK? The rule for the edge of the stick has not changed at any level. You still can hit it hard on the forehand. If you're going to use it on the reverse as a, as a chip shot, so to speak, that is still perfectly legal. Unfortunately, in the wording of the NFHS, there's a bit of a contradiction between the wording on a sweep and uh, rule 8.1, I think it is, that talks about how you can play the ball. The NFHS is in the process of addressing this. Um, there will be no rule change for this year. It's something they're going to discuss. OK, but I firmly believe everyone knows how the game can be played. Um, if there's a. The intent of the wording of the sweep was made for the reverse hit, where it's a reverse sweep that they really want to hit the ball hard. OK, we all know that there can be a bit of a sweep tackle and still use the flat side of the stick from the reverse side. <clears throat> OK, and by rule, you're playing with the flat side of the stick, so those should still be legal. All right. Just keep in mind, all right, that the, the rule itself um, probably could have been worded a little bit differently. The NFHS is looking at that. We've had multiple conversations on it. Nothing is changing as we were speaking. One rule does not get to supersede another rule, okay, in the NFHS book. So as long as they're playing the ball with the flat side of the stick, it's legal, or the edge of the stick on those on the reverse side. All right, and then really quick off topic, but are we coming to a point where there will be a time limit on video referrals? The video referrals still talk about it being immediate. <clears throat> We've put guidance in at the at the um, NCAA level about three to five seconds. Um, as of right now, so, so the short answer is yes, because I know that the rules committee is looking to address this from the FIH standpoint. It's a problem. It, there was one big problem at the Olympics with it where a team used it as a tactic because they messed up the, the uh, stop at the top of the circle and the other team was going on a counterattack. It was pretty sad that it even happened, but they did it. So uh, yes, I can say that the rules committee is looking at it. There's no change to it now. The guidance is still about three to five seconds. Um, after the play is over, OK, um, we know how skilled some of the players are that use video review, especially in Division One. So the ball could get up the field a bit in three seconds. That ball can be almost from one circle to the other. But um, and umpires have to take the video review when they when it when it is uh, when they are approached about it. But uh, I can say this is looking to be addressed in the future. And then Kathy is asking if we could address tackles between the legs of a player with the ball. Yes, I had that on my notes. Um, so thank you, Kathy, for that. I think there was another uh, email I had about that one. Um, there is nothing in the rules that says you can't tackle between the legs. OK, we would hope that most folks that attempt to do that, <clears throat> they do it quickly with a jab to try to knock the ball away. I think we all know as players, umpires and coaches, the longer that stick stays in there, the more dangerous it becomes. Unfortunately, it's a judgment of the umpire as to danger. Uh, my suggestion is a jab in and out should not be a problem. If they trip the player, it should be handled as misconduct because it can be very dangerous. We don't anybody want anybody with broken shins going down, knees being blown out. So the longer the stick stays in there, it needs to be addressed. If you feel as an umpire, it's getting dangerous or the action itself is dangerous, just blow it, show the danger signal. If they ask you about it, say, 
between the legs was dangerous and just move on. Okay. There's no black and white to this. The rules don't identify it anywhere about tackling between the legs. So you can't prevent it, but we would hope that players would be respectful of each other uh, and do that in a way that is as safe as possible. Awesome, thank you. Um, will there be anything specific put in the books about how a penalty will be handed out for a goalkeeper who is shielding or blocking the ball intentionally as opposed to trying to play the ball out to open space? When is it a corner? When is it a stroke, et cetera? Okay, all right. Um, the rules at every level are pretty clear with this, okay? If it's done intentionally and it's preventing a player from playing the ball, it's a penalty stroke, okay? If it's preventing a sure goal, which might not be preventing a sure goal, but if the goalkeeper intentionally shields the ball from a player who is attempting to play the ball, okay? In every rule book, an intentional foul in the circle preventing a player from playing the ball is a penalty stroke. It's pretty much should be that simple or that simple to, uh, uh, in understanding. Okay, um, I don't have anything else at this moment. Okay, um, we've gone a little bit over and I apologize for that. Most of you know me well enough, I can get a little long winded. Um, if you do have any questions, please do not hesitate to send them to us at umpire at usafieldhockey.com. Uh, coaches, players, umpires, any video clip that you have, whether you um, think it was a good decision, uh, was a, is a good video clip, uh, a mistake, uh, something that you don't understand, um, whatever it is, please send them to us. Um, we will be the, do the best we can to answer and get them out there. Um, starting next week, <clears throat> uh, after Labor Day, we're looking to put the behind the whistle back up on USA Field Hockey and the Arbiter site. So we are going to be taking clips uh, from games each week, trying to get them up with a clear understanding of the situation so that everyone can be uh, consistent uh, if they run into those situations. So please do not hesitate to send your videos, questions, whatever they may be, um, and we go from there. All right. Did any questions come in at the last minute, Casey? Nope, just a few thank yous. Okay. Well, listen, everyone have a great season. Um, we look forward to seeing you throughout the season. Um, and good luck to everyone. And good luck to the umpires. And let's make hockey the great game that we all know it is. Thanks so much. Have a great evening.